So y'all know I am a black lesbian in America that has been on the front lines of the movement and the fight for equality for decades at this point. And I have to tell you that in all of my political work and my policy jabber, I really have been most connected to the work that is happening to impact people's day-to-day -day experience in lives, especially marginalized folks. And I can't stress enough how important it is to have groups out there that are catering to the specific socio-emotional and health needs of folks in my community. Groups like The Trevor Project, which is the world's largest suicide prevention and crisis intervention organization for young LGBTQ plus people. And I am just thrilled to have on tonight my next guest, who can speak to why it's especially necessary to have conversations about mental health and well-being for black LGBTQ youth. Dr. Tia Dole is here with us tonight on the show. She is the chief of clinical the chief clinical operations officer for the Trevor Project. And I didn't even realize that y'all had your position, which is amazing. Welcome, uh, Tia. Please start off by telling us a little bit about your role with Trevor. It's it's actually when I um, I have a, a mentee who works at Trevor Project, Preston Mitchum, uh, who I'm so excited is there with you all now. When he was telling me mm -hmm. about his position, I was like, wow, I didn't know that there was an in-house clinician. Mm -hmm. So welcome and please share a about your position. For sure. Uh, also, hey, Brisson, he's amazing. Um, so my role at the Trevor Project is to lead our crisis services. Um, we actually run a 24 hour um, uh, helpline, essentially. So we can do chat, we can do digital, we can do, um, you know, phone conversations, and young people reach out to us every hour, hour of the day, every minute of the day uh, in crisis. And we essentially give them um, um, support so that we can de-escalate them, so they can connect to resources in their community. Um, and one of my my primary jobs, from my perspective, is actually to help those in crisis, to help those with an intersectional identity. And I really appreciate it. Just you, the way that you just came out. I am a black lesbian. As a black woman working in this field, it's really important for young people to see people like you. Um, standing up for them and being strong for them. So just as a, just to give your, you, you mm. a little bit of a shout out, seeing women like you in this mm. field is the most important thing for our young people. Uh, representation matters for sure. Thank you for that. You know, I, I want you to just share with folks, because a lot of times I have to say I was working on marriage equality, right? And then we one and that was a thing and then for a lot of people yeah. they were like oh that's great you won and it's mm -hmm. over and there's not necessarily mm -hmm. a deep understanding of the day-to-day -day stressors and um experiences that lgbtq young people face and certainly intersex gender non-conforming you know like the whole gamut of discrimination and other othering that happens uh with young people so can you speak to us a little bit about like what the experience is like to be queer in America right now? It's, we actually frame so much of our work based on something called the minority stress model. Um, and I like to talk about this in, in terms of what this means. So when you're talking about minoritized youth, young people who have been marginalized by our society, what they experience is a great deal of stress and it has a negative impact on their mental health. Folks ask me all the time, well, why do, why do LGBTQ youth, why are they so much li more likely to um, have suicidal ideations or even make suicide attempts? It's not because of who they are. It's not because of their identity. It's because of how essentially adults treat them in our society. And what it does is it just creates constant stress on them um, and, and it has a negative impact on their mental health. So, you know, you're asking the question, what's, what are LGBTQ youth facing? They're facing all the things that, that other kids are facing, but then on top of that, they're having adults and other children be unkind to them simply because of their identity. Um, and then when you add in another layer of being a person of color, uh, that can actually just kind of push someone over the edge. And so that's why we're here for them. Yeah, you know, I, 
I would love for you to explain, because I was actually going to talk about what it means to be intersex, but, but as the professional in the room, I know that Trevor Project recently did a survey that includes mm -hmm. intersex people whose identity isn't male uh, or female. Mm -hmm. And I, I would love to have you first talk about definitions and how respectfully we understand uh, gender, gender versus uh, reproductive, you know, um, language and how all of that plays out with young people who are trying to understand who they are themselves. And then I would like you to share a little bit about what your survey found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. You know, one of the things that we tend to live in in the United States or really across the world is sort of this this binary where that a person fits in one category. They're either male or female. And that's that's assigned at birth. Right. So a doctor, the baby comes out and the doctor goes, oh, it's a girl. Oh, it's a boy. And then, you know, we then impart societal norms on how this person should dress, how this person should love, how this person should even thinking about careers, how they should move through the world. Um, from our perspective at the Trevor Project, um, everything is in a binary, just like race, right? Not, there are very few things that are, are clear binary. And we understand that from male to female, there is a full range of expression um, and that we feel really strongly that a young person should have a choice about how they want to express themselves, how they don't want to define themselves. And one of the things that we actually try to always remember is to ask a person how they identify. So we have, you know, you have gender identity, you have sexual orientation, um, and how these are expressed may not be um, the same, right? And the same as the, the person who has the same gender identity as them or the same sexual orientation, they may express themselves in a different way. And so, you know, to, to answer your question, um, the way that we define these terms is how young people define these terms and that they get to decide for themselves what what matters to them and and very rarely is it in in one category or another mm -hmm. so you your survey actually talked about um acceptance and i and i really want to i want you mm -hmm. to lean into that and 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 share with us a bit about um what you found on this the power of acceptance because it is so difficult mm -hmm. for parents and and caretakers and you know the adults at school and just people in society to just let a young person be generally right and so you know could you just school us a little bit on why acceptance is so important so we have actually an amazing statistic that is actually incredibly exciting one accepting adult or at least one accepting adult in a young person's life decreases a young person's risk by of suicide by 40%. I'll repeat that. One person in your life saying to you, baby, it's okay, I love you, you, you be who you are, you literally could be saving that young person from making a suicide attempt. And that is the strongest protective factor for saving LGBTQ lives. And so from our perspective, um, that's why we go, we talk to many, as many people as we can because we want to reach adults who are interacting with LGBTQ youth and say to them, if you are kind to this young person, you can save them from death. Mm. Mm. Talk to us about the crisis contact simulator that takes on mm -hmm. the persona of a queer person that counselors can relate to for training purposes? Because I, I always think about, like, how do you determine, you know, what to say and how to say it, and how do you train someone for that? Mm -hmm. So the reason why we actually developed the Crisis Contact Simulator is because we have such a huge need to train counselors on our line. So uh, from our perspective, we were like, we need to figure out how to train people um, to interact with youth faster because there, there's a, such a significant need. So our team developed um, the Crisis Contact Simulator, and it's an AI tool that we made with Google.org. Thank you very much. The fellows were incredible. Um, and what it does is it, it used machine learning from, you know, combing through, you know, thousands and thousands of conversations with youth. Um, and the first person, <laughs> the first Crisis Contact Simulator that came was called Truth. And this represents a person who lives in California, um, and they're facing harassment and bullying. Um, and we have another one called Riley. Um, and, you know, these, these 
the AI technology about it, it behind it is actually really brilliant um, because it's like really authentic conversations. Like there's there's punctuation that's not so great. There are lowercase letters that are not so great. You know, and what it does is it helps a counselor who's in training. Um, to really get a sense of what it's like to talk to someone in crisis. And what I've heard feedback from folks and from my, from my own self looking at it, it, you wouldn't be able to tell. And this is actually mm. the intersection of technology and mental health. One of the things that mm. um, we see in the mental health field is that we're so far behind what young people wanna see um, and, and interact with. And this is actually represents such a beautiful piece of technology that has a direct impact on training more counselors so that they can talk to young people um, in crisis. And why, I, Dr. Tia, why I wanted to have you on to have this conversation about Trevor and just learn more about what you all are working on is that I know that the organization has grown by leaps and bounds over the last few mm -hmm. years. And it is because you are actually serving so many young people that are contemplating suicide, are in distress. So can you just share with us a little bit about um, the, just the volume of the work? Because I don't want that to be lost mm -hmm. on anybody that even though mm -hmm. society is evolving, our young people are still uh, in crisis? So we estimate that there are 1.8 million LGBTQ youth who are considering suicide every year. And, and if you let that number sink in, um, we're still a drop in the bucket from my perspective. We serve more than a quarter of a million young people per year right now. Um, and that is quadrupled in the last two years, um, three years. And you know, one of the things that we keep thinking about is there are so many young people who don't know that we exist. This is the really reason why we have conversations with folks. They don't know that we exist. And every time we kind of come on programs like this or we, we talk to people, more young people come. And so um, it's actually, it's essentially, this country is in a crisis of suicide and it's not just for, for LGBTQ youth. And on top of that, for LGBTQ youth of uh, color, the crisis is even more serious. Mm. Dr. Tia Cole, Chief of Clinical Operations, the Chief Clinical Operations Officer at the Trevor Project. Thank you for your insight and for all the work that, that you do to support our youth. Really appreciate you and for sharing here on Amplified tonight. Thank you.